Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Consulting Podcast. This is your host, Mohammed Misbah, aka The Consulting Guy. Today, I'm very excited to have Florian with me, who is ex McKinsey. So you already know he's a rock star, superstar. But his story evolves where he left McKinsey and started a firm, uh, strategycase.com, to help others get into McKinsey and, and, and like firms. So very excited to have you, Florian. Thank you for taking the time. I know you're around the globe here. Uh, and, and we had to sort of really work out the timing. But how are you this morning? Oh, thank you for having me. Um, this morning here, it's already afternoon, actually. Oh, okay. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm quite good. Um, of course, there's still a lockdown going on. So there's not that much that you can do anyways. Um, so yeah, glad to be here, actually. Very true, right? When you're, when you're locked down, all you can do is talk. And that's partly yeah. where, where, you know, where this started. So very, very happy to have you. And let me tell you, Florian, um, out of all the questions that I get, right, from my social media platform, um, the most common thread is how do I break into MBB or how do I break into consulting? And obviously, as you know, as you've done, a big component of that is the whole interview process, mm-hmm. right? So we'll spend some time there. But before we get into that, um, how did you find out about consulting and how did you get started? Mm-hmm. That's a cool question. I mean, um, I, was, I would say I was a late starter when I did my um, undergrad degree. Um, I haven't heard anything about consulting until the very end. Okay. So I did a classic um, uh, bachelor's degree in business, business administration, and um, I was never too familiar with consulting. And um, at the end, I attended a recruiting event by Boost, which is now Strategy End. Mm. And I actually really enjoyed what they, what they were telling me. And um, before consulting or before actually um, discovering it, I was doing some internships in uh, industry companies like uh, in airlines, in insurance companies, asset management. Oh, wow. And okay. Somehow I didn't like that too much, I have to say, because uh, of the, of the, the, there's several aspects to it, but I think the biggest one was that the people I met there, they were not very enthusiastic about their jobs mm. and they were, there was not like the mindset didn't really, uh, didn't match. Um, okay. So then I went to this recruiting event with Booz and I was like, hmm, that sounds interesting. Maybe it's something different. Um, and that's how I started the, the journey in, in consulting and um, yeah. No, it's so interesting because so many people don't know about consulting and they sort of stumble upon it and then it turns into this amazing career. Um, so so is, that, is that because of your personality? Are you someone who likes to work with people and, and, and clients in that setting versus whether it be engineering or some of these other professions, you're sort of behind a computer and, and not interacting that much? Mm-hmm. I think there's several aspects why I like like consulting as a, as a job. Um, and I, honestly, I only developed like discovered it once I started. You don't know before, right. <laughs> um, but it's uh, it's uh, everything related to I think the, the most important thing is the people you work with. That's yeah. kind of tying it to the aspect I was talking about before. So um, that I enjoyed right from the start. Um, the second thing is I think is the whole travel uh, aspect. I know it's a very heated debate. Many people don't like it. I really enjoyed being away um, every week. Oh, for wow. knowing that it has an end like i knew it's not something you can do a <laughs> lifelong but i really enjoyed the travel part and the aspect of it yeah, yeah, yeah um i enjoyed this kind of project after project um setup that you work somewhere for three months you, you uh, learn about a new industry new client new problem yeah. um then you move on and i think of course there's there's downsides to this as well such as you you get really close to the people you work with for 3 months and then you, and then you probably never go. see them you never see yeah. them again or something like that so um no but overall i i really enjoyed uh, enjoyed the journey um in, in consulting very good very good and 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 what was your process from from the point you found out about this sort of mm-hmm. career choice did you just go ahead and apply and and your resume carried you through yeah, I mean, the resume at least gave me the, um, the, the invitations to the interviews for most firms. Yeah. Um, but it was actually a bit, it took me a bit longer. Um, so I applied initially for all firms for an internship between my bachelor's and master's degree. Because uh, in Europe... All, all consulting now, firms? All, all, like all the consulting firms or generally? Um, no, I applied to, uh, to most of them actually during that period. Okay. Um, and I got also most interviews. And the funny thing is I got the uh, internship. Like my first interview was AT Carney. Now they're called Carney. Yep, yep. Um, and this was my first interview and I prepped for a week, maybe before it. And I <laughs> went there and I got, I got the internship. And then I had McKinsey BCG lined up in the month, uh, from that time. Okay. And I, fi- I failed both for the internship. Oh, so, okay. 
yeah, I, I failed both. And then I did the internship with AT Kearney. Mm. Um, I, I did a master's afterwards. And then I came back and then I applied again everywhere. And uh, only then I got into McKinsey. But interesting, second, interesting. Second try, yeah. So, so why, what led, and if you don't mind me asking, what, what, sure. like during the internship interview, what was it, how was it like, and what led to sort of you not getting accepted this first time around? I think it was very much the same as the, uh, in terms of how it was conducted. Uh, yeah. I think we can get to it a bit later because the McKinsey interview is extremely objective and standardized across offices, geographies. Mm -hmm. So it felt, it felt very similar. However, I was, I think I didn't prepare well. And uh, this is also like the reason why I started the strategy case afterwards, because I felt back then, at least now there's a lot of good resources out there. Yeah, yeah, back yeah. then, there was not that one resource that kind of prepared me for how McKinsey interview probably is. Or mm. is. So you sort of yeah. walked into the interview not, not knowing what to expect, right? It sounds um, like. I, I knew, I, of course, I did some cases with friends, yeah, peers yeah, yeah. and whatnot, but um, the interview was actually... Um, quite different, I would say, hmm. um, from what I expected it. Because of course, there's a difference. I'm not sure if you're aware, McKinsey has the interviewer-led format and all the other firms have a candidate-led format. So it's that is already, I think, the biggest difference. Hmm. Um, and um, yeah, it, but that was the reason. I, I didn't feel it was going very well. And yeah, it was correct. I, was, I had one interview <laughs> and, and the, the problem-solving test, and then I was uh, escorted out of the office. Oh, basically. no. <laughs> yeah, the classic walk of shame. out. Yeah, no, you head down, walk out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's great. And I, I definitely want to, I'm, I'm itching to get into understand sort of how they structure their interview process and and what makes it, it's almost like this, this you know, mystic, era sort of orb around it, right? Like, oh my mm -hmm. God, I'm getting an interview with MBB. How am I going to do? I have a very close friend right now who's in the process uh, interviewing with MBB. And 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 the guy is sort of, uh, I don't, I think he could pass it. He has the skill set, but just the unknown is such a, it's a big thing for him that it's it's hard to sort of penetrate that. Yeah, um, yeah that's true. So what, what did you get your master's in after your uh, first internship? Um, in international management. Okay. In, uh, I actually went to Hong Kong. Um, wow. Did it there. Um, it was a one-year master's, and then I came back and replied, and yeah, then it worked out second second time. It's a charm, I guess. <laughs> and that internship sort of solidified your thoughts around consulting, like this is the career yeah. choice for you? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. how, how was it? Can you can you tell us more about that? Um, well, it was different for the first time. I said I did quite a few internships before, yeah. and this one was, um, I said, I like the colleagues, I like the type of work, I like the travel aspect, even though it, it was not the most exciting um, location I have ever been, but uh, it was still it was still cool. <laughs> where where a, was it? Where was it? In some tiny village in Germany. I uh, like yeah, end of the world okay. basically. End of the world. <laughs> uh, end of the world, and um, nobody was. It was cool, and I think um, that yeah, that solidified my my decision to pursue it. Yeah, but even well. even that's part of consulting, right? Like sometimes you end up in metropolitan cities, and it's amazing, and then sometimes yeah. you're in the boonies somewhere, and and you're sort yeah. of questioning your life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, true. That's great. That's true. So, so then, you know, Florian has, you know, an internship under his belt. You now have a master's. You're ready to tackle MBB. Talk us through that process. This process was, in hindsight, easier than the first time, I think, because I already did all the preparation yeah. one and a half years ago, basically. So when I came back, um, it felt shorter, the preparation somehow. Hmm. And I think maybe there was also more information available already, because I think it was beginning that uh, people started to prepare there is, there was this one platform that became popular uh, which is called prep launch i'm not sure if you're um, not it. familiar yeah okay. they're, they're quite big now um they basically offer uh, professional coaches but also you can find peers really easily to practice with um and i think it just became a bit more of an industry to get people into into consulting um and i just tried to solidify the skills that i already had from last time of course yeah. i was a bit older i was a bit more mature yeah. Um, so the whole process I felt easier in a way. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I yeah. mean, it's interesting because that that initial failure may have planted the seed in your sort of mind for your own firm down the road, mm -hmm. right? That maybe at that point in time the resources were there but limited, uh, mm -hmm. and maybe geographic based. But now now it's becoming more and more apparent that there's a lot of resources out there. Mm -hmm. Right. I I even it's funny because I I do a lot of things in consulting. Even my YouTube ads are. For some of these things, you know, firms you're talking about, right? Uh, get into this and I'll train you three weeks, case, hard, intense, hardcore, case competition ready, whatever, right? Yeah. You name it, it's out there. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, so coming to uh, your interview process, um, let, let's demystify MBB interviews a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. and, and no better person than you, you run your firm uh, associated to it. So tell us about strategycase.com um, and, and you know, what that is and then how, how are you going about the interview process and how do you prep people for mm-hmm. it and, and what are some of the gotchas? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, as you said, the whole spark started basically when I, when I saw there was not that much available back then. Yeah. And uh, in the second try, in the second uh, run up to my, to my MBB interviews and all the other interviews, again, I applied everywhere again, um, just to maximize my, my chances. Yeah, of course. I, I, was, I was writing down like things for myself. And as soon as I got the offer, I kind of started writing a book. I, it, was, it was literally in book format where I kind of okay. gathered everything together, but this was never released or anything. Um, but I knew once I leave consulting, I want to use this material somehow. And then yeah. um, I started, uh, started working. And before I started working, the last thing I did is I registered the domain actually already. So strategycase.com is already I purchased or registered uh, yeah, in 15, early 15, January. I think. Wow. So back then you were already like planning ahead that this is it what was, you're going to do. Yeah. I mean, I, I was not 100% sure it's going to happen, right? But um, and it's, it's Why also not? then a, 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 um, a succession of coincidences, I would say, how it actually came together then afterwards. Um, but, um, yeah, then I, then I worked, of course, then I had no time to, to do anything with the site. And there was also obviously a conflict of interest in, in any yeah, case. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, in, um, uh, McKinsey, I'm not sure you're aware, uh, in, in many offices, you can do a leave of absence after two to three years. Okay. Uh, when you start as junior and you can do a MBA, PhD, um, uh, some, some other stuff. Um, and, uh, I started a PhD after two and a half years there. Okay. Um, and that is when I basically started to uh, write blog posts for strategycase.com. And it was really nothing which had any conflict of interest. It was things like, how do you structure your work as a consultant? How mm-hmm. do you manage your work-life balance? Stuff like this. Um, but this literally had no idea about websites, SEO, anything. Yeah, so yeah, I, had yeah. like, I, had, I got maybe 20 views a month in this, right? And I also <laughs> didn't pursue it actively. I didn't know how to write content for a website, nothing. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, in uh, yeah, 2019, it was in May, I think I, I read an article in Forbes or something that consulting firms are now launching new um, recruitment tools. Um, hmm. Everything is going digital now. Um, McKinsey in, uh, implemented this problem solving game, yeah. which replaces the problem solving test. Um, Bain or in BCG using Pymetrics, Sova, all different kinds of online assessments because it's really cool for those companies um, to kind of outsource it because you can interview many more people or you can at least include many more people in the funnel, right? And you yeah, have no yeah, yeah. additional resources that you need because you can yeah. do all these tests from home. You don't need mm. to go to the office. And with Corona now, of course, this has been- uh, has it been probably uh, amplified it even more. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I read this article and there was all, the first mention about this McKinsey problem solving game, which back then they called digital assessment. And I just, okay. I just wrote a bit about it. Um, and- uh, then I, I published this blog post and that's it. And then in November, 2019, suddenly views on my page exploded. Okay. And, uh, I had no idea what's going on. And it was because this article I wrote was actually ranking first on Google for McKinsey digital assessment. Wow. Okay. And then I was like, Hmm, there seems to be a market now and I seem to have a good starting position. There you go. So what I, what I did is <laughs> I actually sat down three weeks and uh, wrote a guide for this problem solving game. Um, even though I've never seen it, right? If I had seen it, I could not write this guy. So this was uh, lucky that I was oh, not included in this. Okay, okay. So your your interview process didn't have that. This was something they introduced like recently. Yeah, 19. They started in 19, end of 19. And only now they have been rolling it out globally. Um, Interesting. I still had a pen and paper test, uh, the classic problem solving test. Yeah, where yeah, you have yeah. To analyze some. It's like a case, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, this uh, I developed a guide. This was very, very basic, I have to say, but I really was uh, reaching out to people on LinkedIn, game experts and um, cognitive assessment experts and just gathered their input. Wow. Um, and I, pub- I published it. And on the first day I made a sale, which was like completely insane because I wasn't like, when you sell something for the first time online, it's a really big uh, moment. Yeah, it's a someone big actually milestone. Purchased it. But I said, the guide was not very good because I have never seen the game, right? And yeah. uh, what I did then for the first couple of customers I wrote them an email and told them, look, uh, I'll give you the money back when you give me some uh, input on how you think uh, the test is, on how you can prepare and whatnot. 
And this wow. is how it all, all started. I just gathered their feedback and I've been consistently doing it over the last uh, year. Um, and just completely uh, like I created the guide basically from scratch and made a new guide and consist uh, continuously improved it. Um, and that's, wow, this is how, that is how it started. And uh, yeah. So I, I'm already seeing it like the, the entrepreneurial sort of gears were turning the second you know you see saw the, the potential the, yeah yeah no it's it's so interesting okay so you've never seen this game yet you saw the market because of your uh let's just say that you got viral essentially because of your blog post and and that just triggered that hey there's a market out there and then this first sale on the first day of you sort of launching it just reaffirmed and solidified that perspective yeah. that's so cool that's so cool so so how i guess how, now that you've seen, you've been through McKinsey from like the initial process versus the, the way to do it now, what are some of the, the similarities and differences? Like if I were to apply to McKinsey, would someone just reach out and do a screening first? And then if I pass the screening, am I going to go into a case? Mm -hmm. what, can you walk us through that? Yeah. So the only difference <clears throat> from now versus six or seven years ago is that they exchange this uh, uh, problem solving test with the game. So now you do the game and the game. So what you would do is, and this really depends on the office or geography. So you apply mm. in some offices, they will automatically or relatively um, quickly send you this a link to the game. And then you have seven days to, to do to the win game, it. to play the game. Yeah. And um, this means probably that they will assess more people than before because yeah. they also take people from non-target schools now and see if they perform super well on the game, then they might get an uh, invitation to the interview. Very in other offices, like Germany, for example, it is conducted in conjunction <laughs> with the case interviews. So you do both the game and the interview, and the outcome then is basically decided on both, or it depends on both. Uh, so when you, when you say game, like, are you, is it, is it like, a, like a computer program that it's still a questionnaire, or is it actually a game? Like, it's, it's a like, game. It's a computer game. It's a 100% computer game. Like, so I can enjoy it too while playing it. Probably, if it were in the <laughs> situation, um, I think it, it, it sounds fun. I mean, you have current; they have different versions because they are continuously okay. try to change it and make that some is so interesting to me. Um, in in a nutshell, what it is: the most common games is two, and ninety five percent of the people I talk to, they had these two games. It's okay. a, first one is an ecosystem creation. You have uh, either you're on a mountain or underwater in the reef, and you have to select eight species in the reef that uh, need to build a food chain. So they have calories, calories needed, calories produced, and all different other kinds of characteristics that you need to match. And then you have a location and you need to match these, this food chain to a location. And again, wow. there's certain statistics for each of those and you need to make sure they all match and it's sustainable. So that's the first one. And it's really in 3D and quite, it looks quite cool. So it's like a proper like strategy game. We have to kind of like Age of Empires sort of thing, yeah. right? Where you have to like, is, build your own. Is, yeah build your own community yeah. and but this this time you're being assessed and you have to actually think about what you're doing instead of just taking your army and attacking whoever you can yeah, but, come close but to. that is actually that is actually the second game that they're having it's like a tower defense game it's a classic tower defense game okay you just you have a plan in the middle of a, of a map and the map has several squares and you will get some invaders from outside it's usually like rats or foxes and whatnot yeah, yeah, yeah. you have two tools at your disposal you have barriers like uh trees and stuff and you have um defending animals like you have um, snakes for example and uh -huh. you need to place them on the map and prevent uh, the plant from dying and i mean that's very much like a real yeah like, that's, many many games you can download in the app store like yeah like yeah. plants versus zombies is kind exactly. of like that you know that structure like if i could think of yeah wow so they they've literally gamified their like not even gamification from like uh you know getting a dopamine rush of winning something it's like you have to pass a game to proceed um yeah. and 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 it's wow that's so smart because you you have the economies of scale there you could get to a lot more people right yeah. at the same time um you know the the person taking it, it maybe the setting it's a little bit lighter as well i don't know i've never taken it but maybe maybe you it's fun while you do it yeah i think there's also this aspect or at least what they want to do is that they want people to be able to take the game without any background knowledge because initially when you had the problem solving yeah. test, it was still very much focused in a business context, right? And there was actually um, a bias towards people with a business degree. Business, yeah. So I think that that is a big aspect as well. But then again, you introduce a new bias because people that play computer games, 
Well, that's what I'm advantage. saying. Like do you, when you train people for this, are you training them in like, uh, like game strategy or are you training them into like business concepts or how to think logically? Yeah. Like what's your, for this game, literally what I developed is kind of, um, a walkthrough. Um, so also with videos, I mean, there's just screenshots, but, um, basically describing, okay, this is, first of all, this is how it looks, right? Because people yeah. don't know when they go in, they have no idea how it looks. So this already gives you a, an advantage. Um, this is where you can click. This is how the menus work. Um, and then this is what the objective is, because of course, if you know that already, you can kind of prime your, your mind, uh, yeah. your brain a bit. And then there's literal um, strategy tips. Okay, first try to select this, second try to select this and that, um, third be aware of that. So it's really like a step-by-step -step kind of instruction on, on how to pass it. And this is zero to do with any business. Yeah, uh, no, I, I am getting that, right? That's fascinating where it's totally removed from any consulting business or any of that context. It's like, here's a game, go win it, right? And, and the high scorers, a certain threshold will move and certain will not. Yeah, and the funny thing is they also, they started to, it's not only an outcome score, right? If you succeed or not, the plan survives or whatever, but it, they also track a hundred or more than a hundred, I think, um, data points on, on how you move through the game, like your process score, like how you move your mouse, where you click, how long you look at a certain Oh item. my God, that, that's it's very, insane. Uh, yeah. Of course, yeah. Well, it makes sense, right? It's a McKinsey interview that they're going to uh, try and, and test you on that. Now, is there like a webcam involved? Like how do, how do they assure that? No, it's... no. Yeah, there's so no like, webcam involved. So if I apply, and not, not saying I'm going to do this, if I apply, you could play on my behalf and, you know, get a high score and I could get into McKinsey. Yeah, yeah, I already <laughs> actually, I actually got these requests, but I always, I always say no. So I mean, that's then one step too far, I think. I, I'm joking, but yeah, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure there's like IP tracking and everything. So folks don't, don't do this. Yeah, it's that's for a, sure. Yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. No, I wouldn't do it either. And um, yeah. So, so when, when you were applying, you had the sort of standard case interviews and the analytical sort of piece. Um, how did that go? Was that something that you just knew because of your experience with your uh, master's and the internship or did you have to prep as well? And yeah, I mean, you definitely need to prep because there's two, they always say there's two um, elements to it. There's this uh, intrinsic ability to solve cases. Basically, you have the, the necessary skills, you know um, how you do a quick math, or you know how to uh, structure a problem, you have a business savings, something like that, right? Yeah. But then the case interview is such a special format that you need to train on how to approach it. Because like there's certain elements to it which are not natural to you and me, like the yeah. over communication, the over qualification, the like, I, you always have to tell uh, the interviewer why you say a certain thing. Um, and, um, you definitely have to train for that. Uh, okay. So, so what, what are some of the tips you can give? Like, is it uh, outside of like the standard, you know, make sure you, uh, practice with many cases, make sure you communicate, make sure you build a hypothesis or multiple hypotheses and then, and test it out. What are, what are some of the things that you have seen that have worked and especially that you talk about in your, um, in mm -hmm. your training? I think the key is to get familiar first again with the types of questions because every case interview and this is McKinsey um, it comes a bit from McKinsey angle but it's the same for every others as well because it's yeah. still a case interview is to become familiar with the types of questions and the three most common questions is always an analytical structuring type of question where you have a, a problem right and you need mm -hmm. to kind of find initiatives to solve it or what kind of buckets would you look into to analyze the problem type of question okay um then you have exhibit interpretation questions, which is uh, you get one or two charts or data tables, and you need to kind of get out the insights. Okay. And the third one is, is the classic case math problem, right? Where you need to calculate. And this is two steps. You have first come up with a logic uh, on how to approach the question and then plug in the numbers and actually perform the calculations. Mm -hmm. So these are the three types of questions you will face in, in every case interview. Um, and there's a certain um, way on how to approach each of those. Um, okay. I think. So it's, I always argue, because people, usually when I start off with people, they ask me, okay, can you do a case with me, which is related to healthcare? Yeah. And I, I'm always saying the industry doesn't matter. The context doesn't matter because frameworks will never work that you learned yeah. beforehand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea is really to teach people how to approach every problem mm. and um, not how to learn things in advance that will not benefit you during any Yeah, during like it's not, it's, not, it's not that you're going to get a case that's healthcare and specific to you. You may, but... It's, yeah, or it's market different. entry, these classics, right? Market yeah. entry or, uh, uh, yeah, profitability oh my God. case. I've this, this was, seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was it very just, much the case, I think, in earlier days, these um, types of framework cases. And then I think the firms are now getting smart enough that they know that people learn these beforehand. And the I'm questions sure. you get, 
will not be a typical uh you know case in point yeah <laughs> yeah these yeah like these 12 frameworks or whatever like you will never be able to use them in uh, yeah. in McKinsey interview at least yeah. Uh, yeah for sure for sure that that's fascinating now quick question are they in these case interviews um do they want to get to the right answer like if the answer is 10 i'm making it up oversimplifying mm-hmm. do they want the 10 or do they care more about the process of you getting to whatever answer you get to yeah it's uh I would say 90% or let's say 80% about the process, especially when you have these types of questions I said before, for a structure question and an exhibit yeah. question, there never really is a real answer, right? It's all about how well you communicate and how well your content is and how well you structure it and um, how okay. creative, deep and broad you are or how, how what insights you get out of an exhibit, for example. For a math question, obviously there's a, there's a, a right answer, but also this can vary a bit, right? Depending on how you simplify, if you round the numbers, if you take some shortcuts, that's fine. But at least there's a more objective truth than in the other question. Type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it can be, um, I guess, to, to make it easier for folks, it can be that you can get the wrong answer, but because of your, your framework and your process, they like you so much that they pass you in the case. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's, it's really about the approach. Excellent. 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 So, so strategycase.com, like now you've taken your idea of the book and everything you've learned at McKinsey and, and sort of compressed it into this uh, blog or, or sort of training guide. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how do you go about um, like getting your clients or do they reach out to you? Um, mm-hmm. And then what led to the decision of actually leaving a firm like McKinsey? Cause that's a prestigious firm as is mm-hmm. right to, sort of start this own venture? Like, do you have, um, do you have like a, a roadmap in mind that you had to do this? Ugh, I hate using the word roadmap in, uh, in this setting, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it was, it was, uh, I'm taking the first, uh, the last question first, I think. And it was about, yeah. um, why did I leave? Uh, I left because um, it was, I was about to finish my PhD and about okay. to return full time to McKinsey. Um, and this was when this guy kind of uh, went uh, viral and I got some sales. And I mean, the first month, I, the first few months, I, I still could not leave off the website, right? So it was quite of a risky move, but I decided, decided like, I don't want to return full time. Um, and I just uh, do, the, do the strategy case website for, for a bit. It was always kind of a hobby, never planned to do it full time. And yeah. I actually started a new job afterwards as well. So I did something in parallel for a few months Okay. Um, to grow the site, uh, the website on the side. Um, so that was the key reason. And I think I initially I wanted to stay longer and I enjoyed my time there. But uh, also, I think it was a, yeah, the, the stars aligned or whatever you want to call it. it was yeah, no, a, you saw the you saw the view count sort of exponentially increase. You're like, yeah. wait, I need to capitalize this now. I yeah, right? can't, can't really wait for it. Um, so how, how long did it take for you to, because you mentioned that you couldn't live off of it. Like, is that your sole thing now? And, and now you have enough clientele that this is your full-time thing? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was three or four months um, to be able to live off of it. And this is then with the introduction of new stuff, like um, proper coaching, uh, video academy, and other kind of guides for other companies and other things. And I actually uh, took a partner on board, uh, ex-colleague also, McKinsey, a friend of mine. Nice. Um, and uh, he's now also working with me on the website. And we did an academy, for example, together, an interview academy, um, things like that. And I think... Yeah, I said, I, initially I worked somewhere else as well uh, for seven months or six okay. months. Um, and I left end last year um, to fully focus on this for now. Let's see how far it goes. And are, you, are your clients uh, like global? Are they more like university students that are about to break into consulting? Like what's your, who should reach out to you? Uh, literally everyone, because the process is the same for everyone. And the case interviews yeah. will be the same for everyone, no matter if you're an experienced hire or a student. Okay. Um, and the, the, the client base is really global. Because hmm. um, test now, this, I mean, the, the key driver is still this uh, problem solving game. And this is now, I think, uh, in more than 50 countries. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. this is always kind of the, the first thing people find the website um, with, I think. Um, and obviously, we're now trying to diversify, do SEO. Now we're learning. Um, we're All doing the it the, 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 trade, the process right. <laughs> kind of the other way around. Because there's, there's a lot of competition out there. And they're super well optimized. They do perfect yeah. SEO. They have, like, uh, they're in, in, in business since years, right? And yeah. this is a big advantage in, in Google, at least. Um, yeah. No, you, you have to appeal the onion and play the game right, right? Same with YouTube. There's so much like YouTube algorithm stuff that folks yeah. that are trying to break into that side, it, it, you have to sort of learn and, and make sure how do you get your search to be the very top. Same, yeah. same concept applies. It, 
it's such a tough market or in general, <laughs> I, I got, uh, I got so many links on my website from bad websites from yeah. some competition, I guess, for example, to, uh, get you uh, a, raw, a lower ranking. So someone is actively doing these kinds of things already. Oh, and, wow. Uh, well, that's good uh, because other, that means you're on the map, right? The, the fear. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's stressful in one case, but it's great. The other, other side. Yeah. 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 Increase the quality of your <laughs> problems. I heard once. Yeah. Incre yeah. Increase the quality. Of <laughs> that's a good yeah, one. No, it's, it's, it's really crazy. I mean, uh, since we launched this, we have been copied also, uh, already okay. happened twice that people copied the guide. Um, and so you, you can't you to like, much about it. Oh, you're yeah, not we, taking like we, legal we, action? No, because it's super tough. They're in some faraway countries. And um, uh, yeah, I no. mean, the thing is, this was more like a energy boost to make it better and uh, develop other products. So in the end, probably it was beneficial even, Yeah, I would say. Now, are you finding that folks, more folks want to speak to you live in like a trading setting? Or is it still that your guide and your frameworks that you share or the, the, the pre-recorded videos is the medium that most gravitate towards? Mm -hmm. um, well, the guide is one thing because it's also a question of price point. I think the guide is something yeah. Yeah. which is uh, a meal, price of a meal. So most people buy this. Yeah. Um, and then people, I think, gravitate towards the one-on-one -on -one sessions. I would so imagine, it's, yeah. Uh, it's uh, where the most value is. Yeah, one, one session already brings you, I would say, at least a um, big benefit. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're talking about legal and folks copying you. Did uh, McKinsey ever give you any trouble that, hey, what are you doing? This is our proprietary, you know, system and game. And you're here trying to demystify this. Yeah, um, they actually did in the beginning. Um, fair play to them. And uh, this was quickly settled. I mean, they told me you cannot uh, come back full time to the firm and keep the website up. Okay. Um, that's also when I decided, okay, I will um, leave and just focus on the website. And since I'm not using any information, I've never seen the guide, my, uh, the game myself. Um, this is all in the clear. Interesting. So they, their, their restriction was that if you want to come back to McKinsey after your PhD, mm -hmm. let go of your website altogether. Yeah. yeah. And it's very fair. I mean, of course, obviously yeah. you also do the recruiting then and uh, whatnot. And, you, and the, just, yeah, the, any bias or any of that involved. Yeah. And, and that, that just gave you more of a reason to, to say, okay, this is it. This is a make or break. I have to make a decision and, and try it out. It's true. Yeah. Because I mean, if they, if they don't like it, probably there's something that uh, brings value to people. At least. Oh, certainly. Right. Like I mean, there's, there's, just like the people copying you, if, if a firm like McKinsey, not, not that they're threatened by it, but because obviously you're revealing something that they want to keep a little bit of a hush hush. Right. Because yeah. the, the complexity of it is the filter that's there to, to filter people down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and folks like yourself are trying to get more people in at the end of the day. Yeah, but I guess it's, it's the same with everything, right? Whatever assessment there is out, uh, there will be preparation for it. I mean, look at the GMAT, for example. Right? Yeah, that's true. Oh, my God. Whole market. I don't even know how many millions or billions of dollar markets yeah. of GMAT prep. and. Or, or the old McKinsey test, the problem solving test, you could actually buy tests online, which resembled it a hundred percent. So like now it's, it's anyway, completely different. It, it was obvious that it will not stay secret for long. Of course, of course. Yeah. The second, you know, the, for every one thing that someone creates, there's 10 people trying to break it or crack it or, or whatever yeah. <laughs> in, in life. And, and hey, all the power to you. It's working out, right? You're living off of it. It's turning into a great business. Um, and it's sometimes, and I, I'm going into this more uh, than usual because sometimes folks that have these stable careers, because quite frankly, having McKinsey on your resume is, is such a boost, right? In any industry, you could go into industry or other consultancies, yet to break away from that, right? And only after a certain amount of years to start your own thing and, and be presented with the decision that, hey, if either you could do this or do your own thing. And selecting your own thing is quite the jump, I would say it's quite, you kind of have to have belief and trust in yourself that you can execute. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. But th that's also, um, I'm not the, the biggest risk taker ever. That's why I actually started a, a new job right afterwards as well. So I had a two month break or so. Okay. And I started a new job on the side <laughs> and I was always kind of making it a bit um, dependent on that, right? If it goes yeah. well. Um, and then I quit earlier than I wanted to because it actually worked out. So, yeah. But I, I wasn't putting all, uh, yeah, not everything on one horse. No, that, that's great. I mean, all the power to you. A lot of my peers, even myself, like we have entrepreneurial endeavors on the side, uh, but, but it takes a lot to just walk away from a firm, right? And that 
probably thought a lot about it and and make that decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And it's I, to be really honest, I still sometimes think about that I enjoyed part of the lifestyle. Of course, the downsides everyone knows, but the, the upsides are cool. So I sometimes. What I are the downsides now that you mentioned it? I mean, it's uh, long work hours and constant stress. I mean, it's like. <laughs> It's like yeah. part of the qualification should be able to handle long hours, long stress, <laughs> yeah. busy stress. Hey, but but I but I do think in these industries they compensate us at least they try to compensate us well for for what's going on. Um, so so now you know it's interesting. I'm trying to get a per perception of like what you like, and I also know that with your entrepreneurial side, you also like to travel a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, how, how do you do that? Is that your like core hobby? I also see not to, you know, look into your home, but you have a guitar in the background. Nah. How do you keep yourself sane? Well, now it's a bit tricky with the travel, right? But true. you're actually right. The, the goal with this online business was always to be able to be location independent. Yeah. Um, now, it, I mean, you could still travel, but it's not as much fun yeah, <laughs> right yeah. now. So, uh, but it's still oh, for a plan. little bit more. When, when, when once everything opens up again, um, it's my, still my goal to kind of at least uh, temporarily move somewhere else um, where it's a bit warmer, maybe. <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's, that's definitely one thing. But yeah, with now with quarantine and everything, I, I started uh, heavily again because you just saw it uh, investing in guitars and playing playing guitars again. I haven't picked up okay. my guitar since 10 years or 15 years. Is since, is, uh, is uh, uh, strategycase.com also at the end, a guitar lesson, you know, is there a package for that at the end? <laughs> there's there's actually, that's the funny thing is once you have a thing like this running. Yeah, you, you start compare, thinking about you, more, right? <laughs> no, but you see, you see how the others are doing it because there's so many good guitar uh, academies out there online now. Um, and they're basically doing the exact same thing. Yeah. You kind of write high quality articles or do YouTube videos to drive people on your site and then they upsell you with uh, with a good product. Exactly. And for me, it worked, right? If the content is good, then probably the product is good as well. And certainly. Yeah. And and there, there's things to be said, right? Like when when you first land on a web page, just how it's presented to you, right? It, if it's just like a text page without any sort of nice graphicals and all that, I'm, I'm probably going to go with the one that looks nicer, right? Same, like just like with slides, right? Like half of the effort is like making sure that it's presentable in a way that it's digestible and you can understand it. You get the key points out of it versus the content that's on it. But I think in an education business, education business, you still should have some focus, at least at the content. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So what's the end goal here? Like, do you plan on just expanding this into an empire of uh, like uh, educational training? Do you want an exit? Do you want to be bought out? What's mm -hmm. the end goal here? So the whole thing started, um, pretty sure you know Tim Ferriss for our work week mm -hmm. book. So th yeah. this I read several years ago, and this was kind of uh, before I, I, I knew I wanted to do something like this. Yeah. Uh, a product that you can scale without investing um, a lot of time uh, in the long run, right? I invested yeah, a lot yeah, of time yeah. last year. Mm. Um, automated many things. I still do the coaching myself, obviously, and always will. Um, but everything else where I don't add value, I'm trying to outsource now, like SEO, um, SEO, some administrative tasks. Um, and the end goal is actually to make it free, I think. That's something I, I was thinking about um, hmm. over the last month um, because my end goal is not to depend on, on, on it anymore, but this is maybe in two, three, five years. I don't know. So what's, what's going to, uh, uh, so if you make your content free, are you going to live off like the ad, ad revenue? What's the, like, how would you make your. I think the site is too small uh, to actually drive enough traffic. It's very targeted yeah. traffic. So the conversions are good. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you could never live off at uh, at revenue. Uh, do okay. something else. Do something hmm. else. So there, yeah. there's definitely something in your mind that that's that's yeah, polishing Maybe, up. Maybe yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can <could> tell. <laughs> Maybe yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. And, and so what what's the best format for folks to reach out? Like, is Instagram your way to capture folks, or do folks just like land upon your own website? Yeah, I mean, Instagram is something I started um, mm -hmm. relatively recently, I think, and it's zero, like uh, we're not doing anything on Instagram. We have a okay. few nice images on there, but that's pretty much it. I think it's really Google because like you get the email, right? McKinsey interview, what do you yeah. do? You put in McKinsey interview in Google, like how to prepare, or this is really how people um, get to us. But um, I said before, there's this platform called Prep Launch, and I actually registered there now as well and offer the coaching there as well. Hmm. because you get much more exposure. Um, it's, you get much more exposure, much quicker. And the, the good thing about them is that they have, like you get a re reviews for your service and it's then verified by a third party. 
because then people trust you more than when people review you, you on your own website. Okay. And so then now you can, we can point them link. to your own website yeah. and, that, and they could get them more that, targeted. That is, that is not allowed actually. Um, but uh, it's the other way around actually. I can point from my website to prep launch and see the prep launch. These, ver mm. these reviews are verified. Ah, um, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Very good. Do you ever have McKinsey sort of reach out or, or uh, partners or others within the firm reach out to come back or they, they have enough talent? Um, I think that it's actually a cool question. They're growing now this year. Um, I think it's interesting for everyone who wants to apply. They want to take on more people this year than ever before. Okay. So even now everyone is working from home or most people are uh, working from home. They're still growing, which I think is quite, quite cool. And, Very interesting, uh, if yeah. someone, someone reached out, I, I had a call like a year ago already, um, where basically they said, if you drop the website, you are very uh, welcome to come back. But uh, yeah, I think that if, if is it, yeah, you can't accept the if. Yeah. No, that no, that's sale. great. <clears throat> that, that's so awesome. Yeah. And I, I'm definitely seeing like last year, I think it was a little bit challenging with COVID going on and uncertainty, but now firms are starting to pick up hiring again and expanding. And, and you know, we're talking about how, growing our pipelines again. And so that's a good sign altogether. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I'm also very optimistic uh, about the next couple of years. It is. It is. Generally. Now, do you, now from your perspective, is the is the best way to apply to McKinsey just to go on like your on the website and just apply? Is it get in that, you know touch with someone in within McKinsey and get referred? Mm -hmm. So the best way obviously starts way before you you send your application, right? You need to make sure like you to have the right resume, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, I always say there's four elements you need to have, which is education, which means a, a prestigious university, a top yeah. degree, top of class, something like this. Um, then some good work experience already. This depends yeah. a bit on the geography, but mostly you should have done some good internships yeah. um, or even worked before. Then the third one is that you did some cool extracurricular activities, like you were classics, right? Captain of some football team or whatever. Uh, you built an NGO. And then the last thing is, um, it's kind of a, a, on top is if you have uh, some experience abroad, either you studied somewhere else or you had an internship somewhere else. Right. That is already, if you have that, you already have a very strong chance to get the invitation to the interviews. Very I would still, still recommend you to do referrals because this uh, can boost your application a lot, actually. And this you only get if you attend events. I mean, now it's a bit trickier because they're always online and it's harder to actually connect with people on a one-on-one -on -one yeah. basis. But you should still go for it. And I think they're they're adapting because they need to. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So referrals plus good resume is kind of the entry to getting to the to the at least to the, the game. And then, oh, then you have to do <laughs> <laughs> you gotta pass the day, the damn game. <laughs> yeah, then you play the game and then you do the interviews. Yeah. That's great. So what, what was your, sorry, I don't know if you talked about that. What was your extracurricular? I know you did the whole travel and the study abroad. And I mean, that was, that was already seven years ago. I mean, extracurricular for me, what was it back then? I did some social work stuff. Okay. I mean, I always say you don't need to go to Africa and build a, a well or something, right? It's, it's really every day. That, that's stuff. what I'm saying. Cause I, I, I actually remember reading an article um, like years ago now where, where uh, this may sound off, but like, wealthier people, right, have those opportunities to send their kids to do these like very specific things just for their resumes. Yeah. Right. And and that became like a negative thing all of a sudden, right? Where yeah. you're not doing it for the real reason why you should be doing it, but you're doing it just to get it on your resume and, and go yeah. ahead and get it. Yeah. A lot well, of that so goes need, on too. You need like a, a, a well-rounded uh, profile, right? Individual, yeah. A bit here, a bit here, a bit here, but not... Uh build rockets or whatever, right? So not, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure there are people working there that have that. <laughs> Probably, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Rocket engineers. I, you know, I, I have another question that I'm very curious to get your perspective on now that you're mm -hmm. sort of, you've spent the time at the firm, you're away from it. McKinsey tends to uh, attract a lot of controversy with some of the engagements, mm -hmm. true or not, right? Put that aside. How's the, like the culture and, and how's that taken within the firm? Like when a news report comes out that, again, the firm was involved in this engagement mm -hmm. that's, you know, generally looked at as a negative thing. How, how do you yeah. guys perceive that? That's a cool question because obviously you talk a lot about it uh, yeah. while being in the company. As soon as you step out of the company, like you kind of cut off, right? So you don't uh, know anymore. But um, from my perspective, I answered a similar question recently. Um, I think... It's on one hand, it's a bit overblown because 
like any other consulting firm, there's thousands of uh, engagements going on at the same time, mm-hmm. all the time. So you, yeah. you only ever hear about the one or two or three or five a year, which uh, kind of have this negative uh, spin on it. So I think it, it's overrepresented in a way. And of course, it's a decentralized okay. firm, which means you, you can really do whatever you want. And there's at least back in the day, there's probably not enough control mechanisms because it's so decentralized. Hmm. Which on the one hand is a strength, but then obviously if you have a bad apple, this can result in bad en- engagements, bad publicity. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how this talked about, it was always obviously a big topic during lunches, uh, during team <laughs> dinners and, uh, and whatnot. Imagine. <laughs> yeah, of course. And I mean, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't say, I would say it's, it's zero how, um, zero represents the people that work there. Okay. So the, the people I work with were really amazing and um, really cool, cool people, so. Okay, so we'll, we'll let that slide. Maybe maybe the media is just doing what the media does. No, no, I mean, no, no the, media is, <laughs> the media is fully correct on these cases. Okay. A hundred percent. I mean, that, that's that's obvious. And I mean, I think- um, It's the few bad apples now. you're saying, essentially, or the yeah. few bad engagements or whatever you will, where yeah. maybe- the bad, the bad apples that lead to bad engagement. And it's a, yeah. with the size of the firm, I think every consulting firm is, uh, is uh, constantly a bit in the- in this scope. Oh, I'm sure. Like I, I'm, I'm sure. I, you know, I, I still work for a consulting firm, so I can't, I can't deny or, or accept that. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's things that go on that the everyday person isn't familiar with, and then something happens, yeah. and the news breaks out. Yeah, that, that's another part. How the perception of consultants in in the bigger society, um, yeah, is, is, is a bit uh, detached from that because they think every every engagement is like that, right? And um, for example, I always got this, uh, this insult or not an insult, but I heard very often, uh, you only fire people in McKinsey. And I had one engagement out of, I don't know, 20 maybe, where yeah. we worked on the cost side of the business. The rest was growth. growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these things are completely overblown. Yeah, and, and it's definitely people that are not familiar with an industry and they're not familiar with the type of work that folks do. Yeah. And they think that consultants just walk in with their suits and then people are start reducing yeah, right, okay. in the firm. That's not the case. No. Excellent. Excellent. So what, what's next for you, Florian? Like now, now you're just thinking about growing your website. You're thinking about just waiting, making this uh, lockdown over so you can travel again and, and just work your four hours. Of, what was the, the book? Sorry, the, the four day work. Four, 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 four hour. hour. Yeah. I mean, it's not a four hour work week uh, just yeah. yet. And it probably not, will not be because of the coaches because you cannot outsource them. How do you outsource that, least, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can write an AI program, right? Yeah. There's actually a guy that contacted me uh, mid last year who yeah. was building a case robot. Oh and we God. had a call, but then he never came back and he wanted some input for his case robot. Um, so there's I'm people sure. building that actually. But yeah. Even BCG sure. is using this now. I'm not sure you know this. They have a case, a case, um, chatbot case. So they okay. replaced their old online case, which was also similar to the McKinsey problem solving test with a chatbot. And you get, I think, eight questions uh, and you need to write in a chat window with the bot. Oh, my God. So there's, so no, everyone the there's no nothing. No. You gotta, <laughs> see, that, that's where you have like the input versus output conundrum where you got to get something right in your text yeah. for you to move on. Yeah, no. So How do you yeah, train the, to that? <laughs> like, is your training just go on websites and chat with chatbots? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I mean, in the end, the skills are all the same, right? You need to yeah. interpret some charts, you need to do some analysis, do some math. Um, it's always kind of the same thing. They're just trying to make it a bit simpler for them, I guess. But yeah, Absolutely. not ideal. <clears throat> not ideal. I think for the candidate. Um, but yeah, no, my, my perspective as, uh, as discussed, uh, still work on the website, grow it, do some coachings. Um, and then let's see, as soon as uh, it's possible to travel and safe to travel properly again, kind of uh, travel for a bit. And then yeah. let's see how, how long it takes to get the website to a nonprofit. That's, uh, that's the idea. That, that, you know, that, when you mentioned that's a very, very interesting approach, taking it nonprofit, as you say, you know, and, and make it accessible to everyone um, and then move on to something next. That's a, you know, I, I wouldn't have, I would have assumed at least I would have thought about it just growing and having more products and cross-selling and upselling people mm-hmm. and, and just increasing my, my share of things. But you're, you're thinking about it very differently. Yeah, that, that's what I'm doing now. I'm at this stage now to grow and upsell and everything and do proper content, proper yeah, service. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's not my long run, long-term passion, I think. 
um, to, it was kind of an, a hobby that started on the side and became into a business somehow. And that's the best but, thing. Uh, but um, yeah, I think uh, my, my industry interest and in everything going forward is a bit different. So that's one reason. And the other reason is that I just got so fed up with everyone copying the content. And oh, I was like, no. okay, then I'll, then I'll just uh, do everything Make it free. free. And, uh, yeah, good <laughs> luck then. Well, that's true because then... Wow, I, I get it. You're going to make it free and then that kills your competition, essentially, right? Who are charging for the same content. At, at least, yeah, at least we're on the products that they um, just took. That they took from you directly. Yeah. So it's a good way. It's kind of like a, the kill it's a kamikaze approach. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's like the, the kill, what's the movie? The Ready Player One, that, that final tool, the, the, the bomb, right? That kills the whole game and everything. Okay. You should watch the movie. It's a, it's a good movie. But it kills I you think- in the process. But it kills everyone around you as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but I mean, it, because uh, it's not the sole reason. Uh, obviously, yeah. it's stupid. But no, um, I could tell like, you definitely have something in your mind. So I need to get you back on the podcast, like down the road when your next venture is up. Two years, three years, maybe. Two, three years. <laughs> okay, I will, we'll be, we'll be definitely be in touch. That's, that's cool. you know, yeah. I'm gonna follow you for sure. So, folks, uh, Florian strategycase.com, best way to contact. Reach out on Facebook. Uh, on sorry, Instagram strategycase.com directly. Are there other platforms yeah. or channels? Please. Um, I think, uh, no, the website is the best because then you can also get an overview of our profiles and uh, can get a lot of content actually for free. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just shoot an email on uh, info at strategycase.com if you want. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Florian. This was awesome and I wish all the best to you. Uh, great journey. Only one wish, I think, uh, a journey that folks wish to have, I wish to have in one day where, you know, I, I find something that I could do and build it myself. But you're doing uh, it right now. <laughs> I'm not sure you're aware. <laughs> yeah, probably. We'll see. <laughs> I, I haven't had that viral, you know, growth. and, and It takes thing. a while, but yeah. 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 No, but all the best to you, Florian. Thank you so much again for so taking much. the time. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Likewise. Have a great day. All right. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye.